Hi everybody, today I wanted to share with you some insight into my process from research to sketch to final. This project came about because I had a client reach out and she was really interested in this piece, but unfortunately it had already been taken by another collector. But she wanted it so bad that she asked me to make her a new one and she said I could change the animals, I could change the colors, it was all up to me. Um, so that made me really excited to have free reign on a project like this. When I'm starting a new piece, the first thing I do is research. I try to decide which endangered species I'm going to be painting, and I use the International Union for Conservation of Nature website for this. They go into so much detail about each species, including population size, risk factors, their conservation status, geography, etc., and it is such a useful tool for me. Once I decide on which species I'm going to be using, I start doing a lot of preliminary sketch work. So sometimes I'll experiment with different poses, sometimes I'll explore certain aspects of each animal, maybe I want to show it off from the side, maybe I want to show it off from the front, um, and just decide which poses are the most interesting for the animals. For this piece, I wanted kind of a combination of action poses and still poses. For example, you'll see the harpy eagle is in an action pose, so he is flying down, it looks like he's about to catch prey, whereas the adax could be still possibly walking, um, but it's good to have that mixture so you have motion going throughout the piece as well as some stillness. I'll also make little notes just so I make sure I know the exact name of the species. Um, as you can see, I've also written down their conservation status and where I'm going to be placing them in this piece. So because I have those nine boxes that the species will go in, I wanted to make sure I remembered which one went where. Once I am done with those preliminary sketches, it's time to put a very light sketch of what the final will look like down on my paper. So you can see here, I've just done some really light lines. I don't want my graphite to mix in with my watercolor. I don't want it to smear. So I just do some very, very light lines. For this piece, I knew I wanted the background color palette to be a little bit different from the original, kind of change it up a bit update it, um, and so this is what I came up with. You can see here the original palette and the new one I came up with. Now that I've got my color palette, it's time to break out the watercolors and start doing the washes of the backgrounds that are behind the species. I chose each color for each species very carefully. Some I wanted to make sure were complements, so you'll see here I'm doing kind of a red orange behind a blue green iguana so those are complementary colors um, if it's a very light animal i want to make sure that the background is contrasted enough the background's dark enough for that light colored animal to pop and vice versa if it's a dark colored animal i want to have a lighter background so they don't blend in and clash too much here I'm going back in using the wet on wet technique. I'm taking some darker reds that will stand out against the original red that I used before. That way I'll get some nice textures and some blooming. So now it's time for one of my favorite parts. It is one of the most tedious parts, but that is doing the background pattern work. You'll see me use all sorts of different mediums from gel pens to colored pencils, watercolor on top of watercolor, Posca pens. It kind of changes um, between each background just because I want to give some nice varying textures within the work. 
This transparent ruler is my best friend. I use it every single day. It really helps me get some varying sizes of squares and diamonds by using the different measurement lines. Um, so I'm not necessarily using a ruler how it's supposed to, uh, but it helps me a lot for sure. And once again, just having those different sizes of squares and diamonds makes a really nice contrast. Um, if they were all the same size, I think it would look way too busy. And so by having different sizes, um, it makes a really nice contrast. So now it's time for one of my favorite parts and one of the most terrifying. It's time for my gold ink. I just have been using this ink with my fountain pen and I found that I really enjoy the way it looks. Although I cannot use my ruler with it, obviously the ink would just go everywhere. So I have to do it freehand, uh, which could be quite frightening. But I love the way it looks, even the little nuances and mess ups uh, just make it look you know, more human. This was done by hand. I'm not a machine. I can't have perfect lines all the time. Um, but it also kind of raises the texture, which I really like. And I think it makes this middle block stand out, which is the whole purpose. Now that the background textures and patterns are done, it's time to move on to the border. So I started scouring my textbooks for a medieval border that I liked and I found this one. I instantly fell in love with it, but first I had to make sure that it looked good with the rest of the piece. So I took a picture of it, put it into Photoshop and started practicing kind of a faux border around it just to make sure that I liked the colors and the patterns with the rest of the piece. Once I decided I liked it, it was time to figure out all of the measurements for all these triangles and diamonds. I think there's over 400 total that I had to measure out and paint, um, but I really like the look of it. I think it is much more interesting than the border on the previous one, so I think I gave it a nice upgrade. Now it is time to do the gold section of the border. I am always experimenting with different gold mediums just to try and find the one that I like the best, whether it be watercolor inks or gouache. So for this piece, I was testing out Holbein's acrylic gouache in gold. I must say it is not the favorite one I have ever used. As you can see, it's kind of transparent. My brush kept pushing the paint around. It didn't really want to dissolve into the paper and pool together and blend very well. So it took a lot of coats, um, but once I did enough coats, it did look fine. I just might not use this one again.
Once all of the gold sections were dry, I then went back in with my ruler and my black Posca pens and just gave all the borders more of an outline. This helped to give it a more defined edge and just helped it pop a little bit more. Finally, it is time for the animals to come alive. As you can see, I work on multiple animals at the same time just so that I'm not wasting time while another animal is drying. I can start on the other one. Just like I did for the border, once the animals are done, I go back in with a black Posca pen and give them a little outline. In medieval bestiaries, they are almost always outlined, and so I like to do the same with my own. And the piece is complete. I really enjoyed working on this piece, even though it took a really long time. I feel like I learned a lot. I think I really improved on the original. I can definitely see how my technique and my observation skills have improved, and that's always really encouraging for an artist. I hope this gives you some insight into my process, the sketching phase, the research phase, painting, all that good stuff. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the comments. I would love to answer any questions you have. If you'd like to see more behind the scenes, I am always posting some sneak peeks of things I'm working on in my Instagram stories, so you can find me over there. Um, but don't forget to like and subscribe and I hope you have an amazing week. I'll see you next time. Bye